Carol, thank you very much. Did you hear a noise just then, by any chance? I did, yes. Yes, it was just a little a minor accident here. Uh, just something got knocked <laughs> over. It happens, you know, it happens. Everything all right? We'll do the repairs a little later on. Let's carry on. 12 minutes past eight. We're always pleased to speak to the author and poet Michael Rosen on breakfast. Absolutely. This time, we are particularly happy to say he'll be on the programme in just a couple of minutes. Because Michael is writing again after surviving a near-fatal COVID infection around this time last year. Tim Muffet explains. I remember just thinking, I can't let him die. Author Michael Rosen owes his life to the actions of other people. Dr Katie Amiel called round to his home as his symptoms of COVID-19 worsened. When we checked his oxygen levels and they were 58%, at first I thought it must be a mistake. Um, I've never seen oxygen levels that low in someone conscious before. Um, and I just said, we need to get Michael to the hospital straight away. The ambulance service was very overwhelmed at that time and realised it would be quicker to just get him into the car and, and drive him there. Michael was in an induced coma for almost seven weeks. His experiences in hospital have inspired his new book, Many Different Kinds of Love, from which these illustrations are taken. I remember holding his hand and trying to communicate with him. It was chaos at some points um, and it can be so scary for, for the patients, incredibly scary. These are the hands that touch us first. Feel your In 2008, head, Michael pulse, wrote this poem, These bed. Are the Hands, to mark the 60th anniversary of the NHS. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm. His poem was laminated and stuck by his bedside, and so whenever we'd be treating him or being by his bedside, we would randomly read words of it, and it was very encouraging. These are the hands that touch us first. In July of last year, staff at the Whittington Hospital, where Michael was treated, recorded their version of his poem to mark the 72nd anniversary of the NHS. I didn't know who Michael was because I've only been here in the UK for three years. I came to know his works and then I also learned that he's, um, he's advocating for the NHS. When, when I read this poem, it's, it's very empowering. Clamp the veins. Make the cast. Lock the dose. And touch us last. And I'm delighted to say we can speak to Michael now. Good morning to you, Michael. Good morning to you, Charlie. I hope you can see me. Yeah, we can see you. Me. We can hear you. We can see you. All is good. So first up, let's do the health check. How are you? Um, yeah, I'm feeling quite good this morning. Uh, I have some permanent damage. Uh, my left eye doesn't really see very much. My left ear doesn't hear very much either. And I have numb toes. But um, the good news is the blood clots have gone from my lungs. I'm not quite sure about the micro bleeds in my head. You notice the technical language here, uh, as if I know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, I assume they have, because I, I don't think about blood very much. So I'm guessing that they've, they've gone. Michael, uh, morning. I'm glad you're morning, um, you, recovering. Morning. Um, so it was March last year when you went into hospital, you started to feel ill. How long have you been out? Um, <laughs> right. It, I'm not very good on dates and timing. That's I have fine. a bit of brain fog in there, but I left hospital at the end of June. So I've been out since then, since the end of June. So you've had yeah. quite a long recovery period um, and it, this is a gradual process. What did you learn about yourself? So we'll come to the book, because I think the book is really, really personal. Yes, um, I guess I've learned about recovery and I've learned about a near-death experience. So those two big things are what I've learned. And recovery is very, very strange because there are two people. There's me before I got all this stuff and then me afterwards, and I keep wrestling with... Um, whether they're the same person or not. Um, and in its own way, I mean, it feels quite odd and almost funny, but um, that's, I guess I have to come to terms with that. So I, that's what I'm learning. I'm learning uncertainty, I guess. I'll tell you what, another thing you might have learned as well, is just how popular your books are <laughs> and how much you've touched people in the most unusual circumstances. And I'm talking about the nurses that worked with you, that worked for you. 
Yes, they were incredible, and I'm glad to say that they're, they're in the book. Um, the nurses, um, their, their diary that they kept when I was in intensive care, the, the nurses kept a thing called a patient diary where they wrote me letters um, sort of at the end of their shift. So I've got these letters in a, in a book, and this helps um, helps me understand what actually happened, that I was completely dead to the world. I mean, I, I wasn't totally dead, obviously, but um, uh, it, I just didn't know what was going on. And when I've seen pictures and films of me in, the, in that experience, I can't remember a thing about it. It's like a, a, a place I was, but I can't go there. It's like a sort of forbidden territory, the coma that I was in. Well, it's very well described, and we're seeing some of those images now. Let's speak to one of the nurses who helped you, intensive care nurse, Carmen Malone. Carmen, hello to you. Uh, just tell us a bit about you. So you were one of those who was helping uh, Michael when he was uh, at his lowest points. Tell us a bit about that. So I was basically um, the nurse that one of the nurses, myself and two uh, other colleagues, um, we admitted Michael on the night that he was... Um, brought into Whittington Hospital. Um, he came to us in the early hours of the morning. Um, he was gravely unwell. Um, I heard you saying before, his oxygen saturation levels were 55% when we got him. Um, so it was clearly danger zone for him. Um, so we quickly had to put him on a full face mask um, and hook him up to the CPAP machine um, to blow high flow oxygen into to his lungs to inflate them. Um, yeah, and he responded really well to that. Um, he was my fourth patient, I admitted that night. We were extremely busy. Um, I did vaguely recognize his face at the time and I did ask him, was he famous? And he winked at me, but he obviously won't remember that now. Um, but uh, yeah, he responded really well to the CPAP and he was, uh, I went home that morning and when I came back from my next shift, he had actually been discharged to the high dependency unit and we thought that he was doing okay. But unfortunately he deteriorated some days after and he came back to us very unwell and we had to quickly intubate him and put him on the ventilator. Um, Michael, uh, is there anything now, I, I'm not sure if you have had a chance to talk to Carmen, you know, since. Is there anything you'd like to say to her? Carmen, hello. I mean, I, I, I apologise first that I hardly remember anything from these times, but That's my uh, gratitude doesn't express it. The care and the devotion and the kindness and the knowledge, experience, skills, everything that you and your colleagues poured in I, I it's as i say gratitude doesn't express it i'm overwhelmed by it it's so wonderful i can't actually see you at the moment but to hear you it's it's quite difficult actually even to sort of think about it so thank you very much indeed thank Can you I, i'll thank explain you. to you michael there is a big smile uh, on the <laughs> and the face of the nurse who looked after you uh carmen i i you, this is your day job you're doing this Every day, Michael's one of many people you'll have helped, but it must be so lovely hearing that. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, uh, you know, on behalf of myself and all the ITU staff, um, all the helpers from the most senior level down to the um, new student nurses, everybody that banded together during the first wave of the virus, um, um, you know, it's, it's what makes it worthwhile. All the fear, all the sweat, all the tears, all the stress, um, to be sitting here this morning and to be listening to Michael, um, one of our patients, um, continuing on his road to recovery is what makes it all worthwhile for us. Michael, what do you find difficult about this? You said it was quite difficult. As I'm a parent and anyone who's a parent or a grandparent or a carer, you know that you, you go the extra mile for your children and it's whatever that love is, that's what you do and you mop their brow and you do all those things. And when I was in there, there were nurses who were strangers to me um, who were doing that for me, were parental love. That's what it feels like being done for me. You, you heard Carmen's words there. What did she say? Sweat and care. And it, I mean, it's, to me, it sounds like a parent, but I don't know Carmen and she's done that for me and all the others. I mean, my intensive care ward, um, was equipped to hold 11 
but I think it got up to 24 at one point. And people were dying. The, the consultant says uh, it was at 42% at one point. So the stress, the strain on the nurses and to be able to go that extra mile, I say it feels parental. It feels like a mum or a dad doing that for you. And, um, you know, that's, that's why it's difficult to sort of uh, take it in, if you like, and, and appreciate it. I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to find words for it. Yeah, Michael, there's a, there's a line in it. Now, I'm always hesitant to sort of read out poets' words to them, but there's a line that jumped out at me. And, and at one point you say, there is a place between life and death. I was there for weeks. I was. Um, I mean, Carmen and, and Dr. Katie have described that I was on this incredibly low level. I think I, I, my liver and kidneys were in trouble. Uh, I think I got a secondary infection. Um, so, yes, I think it was touch and go. And then it feels like between life and death because I, I can't go there. It's like a blank. So I, I've got these moments just as I was... Uh, being taken to the hospital by my wife uh, Emma, Emma and my daughter, to, our daughter took us, took me there, um, and that sort of then it stops, and then I've got these vague memories of the waking up, of of coming round and um, eating porridge in the morning, and but that's like whatever it is, it's it's about forty seven, forty eight days, just gone, you know, I, I can't I can't get them, I can't I can't go to a shop and get them back, you know. You know, I think it was really interesting the way you described, um, Michael, just the intensity, the pressure that the hospitals and the nurses and the carers were under. And Carmen, I've got to ask you, there is a moment in Michael's book where he describes, he doesn't remember it, where you sang, the nurses sang happy birthday to him. And he, he wasn't aware of this. He has no memory of this. He wasn't, he wasn't conscious. For you, yeah. when you're under all that pressure and you've got what double the capacity, you're filling filling wards, where do you find the energy and the compassion and the thought, just the thought of showing that love, and it is love, to someone who you know isn't going to hear, but it's important? Yes, it's very important. Um, you know, um, we're aware that especially with the diary, you know, the, the people think that when the patient, um, they, when they've left intensive care, that their journey has ended, we've saved their life. But actually, in fact, their journey is just beginning. Um, and um, you need, they need to, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. They need to piece together. They've lost 20, 30, 40 days um, of their life. And um, psychologically, that can be, that can really affect the patient. And having something like the patient diary, um, marking little milestones, things they done in the in the day, doesn't matter how little, um, it can he help put them the, the pieces of the puzzle back together. Um, and uh, yeah, Michael celebrated his birthday while he was with us, and um, we all gathered together. We just stopped what we were doing for a couple of seconds and all gathered together and sang happy birthday around his bedside. Um, which was really nice. And we wrote that in the book for him so that when he looks back on it, he knows that it didn't go unnoticed. And, you know, we took we took a few minutes to celebrate with him that day. Well, Carmen, it's so lovely talking to you. And, and I'm, I, you know, it's lovely watching Michael react to what you said as well. Thank you, Carmen, very much. And Michael, it's a really, really personal oh. book. But it's also, I tell you the other thing, my, my impression is it's very uplifting. It's actually really uplifting. Oh, it's it's lovely. deeply personal and there are harrowing things, but it's very, very uplifting. So it's really lovely to catch up with you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks again to Carmen and everyone in the NHS who, who helped me. Thank you. Take yeah. care, Michael. Good luck with the recovery. Obviously, it's going to be very emotional. He's still recovering, as he says, and, you know, there is just this brilliant service that we're so lucky to have. Yeah, uh, Carmen's Lots just one of many. And in, in the book, there, there are, you know, Carmen is, is one we have spoken to this morning. There are literally dozens, aren't there, of voices you, you hear there of wonderful things I that think have it, happened. It's like a story of love, just love and care. It's very uplifting. Find out what's happening wherever you are this morning. We'll see you shortly.